Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The View. I'm so glad that you've joined us. I'm really excited today because we're going to talk about this new book. Can you see it? Testimony, The Transformative Power of Unitarian Universalism. This is the first copy ever. It just arrived here 10 minutes ago, and I'm the editor, though by no means the main author. So we're going to talk about that. Because of that, I'm going to ask Michael Tino to take the helm because Asia Hauser, our other regular, is also in the book. So um, I'm just saying hey from Minneapolis and welcome. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. And maybe uh, Asia, you want to, and Jessica, you want to say hi before we introduce our guest? Hi, I'm Asia Hauser and I'm in Seattle, Washington. Jessica Star Rockers doing tech, also from the Seattle area where it's, I say it every time, but it's very early here. Well, we, we are glad that folks on the West Coast can participate in this. It's not particularly early here in New York, um, so it's good to be with you all, and it's good to be talking about testimony. So we're going to be talking about uh, how we talk about Unitarian Universalism today and how we um, proclaim some good news in it. And joining us today um, is our old friend, the Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford, minister of the Live Oak UU Church in Austin, Texas, and Mandy Goheen, who is the um, CLFs, the Church of the Larger Fellowships, director of our prison ministry. And it's good to have you both here with us too. Joanna, I understand that it was a conversation between you and Meg that sparked the idea for this book. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, I went to a evangelical ecumenical seminary. And so my classmates were National Baptist and AME and Quaker and UCC and one little UU. Um, and so we would often, because it was ecumenical, um, we didn't we we wouldn't assume that we knew that much about each other's denominations and so we would ask about them and what i realized was that my you know i i had been all schooled in have an elevator speech you know have this really simple thing that that explains unitarian universalism and none of my classmates did that it never even occurred to them what they did is they had a testimony and their testimony was less about the particular peculiarities of their denomination and more about how their church had saved their lives and it was very compelling like they you know i would hear these testimonies and i'd be like "Ooh, i want to come visit your church and so meg and i were talking one time and i said you know i i think that we're really kind of doing this wrong we tell people you know to have an elevator speech so that they're prepared to talk about their church. But if our, you know, what's our goal? If our goal is to bring more people to Unitarian Universalism, like people have great stories. People have stories that will break your heart. You know, let's get those stories out there. Let's get people to testify. Is that kind of how you remember it, Meg? Yes, it is. And, and it was, when you said it, I just thought, Yes, that makes total sense. I mean, we have to be able to explain Unitarian Universalism after people are interested in it. But to think that what people want is a historical description of a religion and, you know. Um, Emerson was a Unitarian Universalist. Yes, that converts white right. people. Right We're short with famous white people. You know, I mean, just all of the things that we do that are just like, that isn't why people want to join a community. So, and I should say also, though, that this book also came from Marshall Hawkins and the staff at Skinner House Books. They, independently of Joanna and me, must have had the same conversation. And Marshall contacted me and said, we want to do a book um, of personal stories. Would you be interested in editing it? And I said, oh, my God, yes, because um, every time the world would ever do a survey about what you wanted that's what i would say i would say more personal stories of how this faith saved people i need them and i write in the introduction about um i got guideposts when i was a kid my conservative aunt and uncle sent it to my unitarian parents and my parents just kind of tossed it aside but i loved it it was this little magazine 
of stories of just wretchedness and misery that were saved by Jesus. And I was way less interested in Jesus and way more interested in the wretched misery part, you know? And, um, and so I got really like, I, and I loved true confessions magazine too. I mean, we just love each other's human stories, the real beating heart stories. And um, so I, I just got super excited about it myself. And one of the things that I said is I really want to include some of the Unitarian Universalists who are currently incarcerated because they have some of the best stories that I ever read about how this faith is saving them. And um, so that's why I wanted Mandy to join us today because there are a number of, among other voices like Asia Hauser's and many others, um, there are a number of um, people who are writing from prison. Um, and I'll tell you what, those letters which we get regularly are, are you know, on days when I think, what am I doing? Does it matter? One of those letters can just say, yes, <laughs> yes, it absolutely matters. And for all the people who say, you know, that we're religion for only privileged people, I say, come and read these hundreds of testimonies of people who are the least privileged people you'll ever run into, and you will change your mind about that. So Mandy, um, could you tell us about some of those stories and what it's like to uh, to receive that that testimony as our prison ministry director? Sure. Um, one of the parts of that that's really interesting is it's our culture to receive testimonies from our members who are incarcerated. And the reason it's our culture is we send out a newsletter twice a year to folks and we ask them a question generally. We ask them, what brought you to the CL? What do you love about the CLF? Or do you have a prayer to share? Or do you have something to share? So we always have like a back and forth with them. So we get a lot of um, a lot of testimonies from them, and I was really excited that there are actually ten of them in the book. So that was really cool. Um, and some of my favorite—you're not supposed to have favorites—but some of my favorite names are in the book. So that's exciting. Um, some really prolific writers, and I will be honest. Um, two things I wanted to say today is our numbers are growing, and the testimonies are what make our numbers grow in the prison ministry because it's all been word of mouth from one inmate to the next and they talk about Unitarian Universalism in such a way because it's saving them especially people who are um, dealing with issues of their sexuality and questioning um, where they they stand and questioning whether they're precious and a person who deserves God's love um, many of them are still very, very Christian and so we've had one person that said I the CLF has been a lifeline that has saved my life, and Unitarian Universalism has saved my life. We hear that constantly. Um, I have one letter that I opened right now, and it says um, that I'm proud to be a Unitarian Universalist. That's the other thing. They have this really sense of pride and deep ownership to this religion because before they found us, um, they were labeled as somebody who was damaged or bad, and, and we're here to really um, celebrate um, what's great about them. And it says, today I'm not alone. I have a beautiful family, and I'm the member of a CLF, at the CLF, my home. I love you all and wish you great blessings. So we get blessed so much and get so much feedback from people that it is, I agree with Meg, if you're having a bad day, it's almost like looking at a picture of a baby. You can just kind of go through these testimonials and just really feel um, this underlying heartbeat of our faith and how it saves people's lives. Well, thank you for receiving those those testimonials the most I mean I would imagine it's a great honor and privilege to be the person who gets to receive those and um, sort of get receive receive those blessings on all of our behalf so. yeah and I try to share them I, I haven't done it for a little bit but I, I'm gonna start another habit of getting back on Facebook live and sharing them once every week or so just so other people get blessed by what we're hearing what we're hearing from people who are incarcerated that are UUs. And the other thing is our growth because of this testimonial and this, this culture, we have grown in the last four months, 40 members, which is amazing. And right now we're at a 
823 members of the Church of the Larger Fellowship are people who are incarcerated. So that is just really incredible. And I think it goes to, I, I don't know, they just, everything, they just feel so honored and so at home with us at the CLF. So it's just really wonderful. But I wanted to brag about the 823 number. Said One of my favorite pieces in the book from an incarcerated member is um, a guy who's not Unitarian Universalist, but he said Unitarian Universalism has changed his life because his cellmate is. And he's learned so much just from being with him and the kindness. And, you know, when you hear somebody write you, and, and I'll tell you, writing the quest column is probably the hardest thing I do because I'm always trying to figure out what I possibly can say about spiritual themes that will reach 850 people with lives that I literally can't even imagine. And um, and in fact, this month, my, my column on vulnerability, I, I just hated it. I almost didn't even, I was like, Lynn, I can hardly stand to print this. I hate it so much. And I've gotten so many letters from prisoners saying that column, because it, to me, it reeked of privilege. You know, it was like, I got kittens. And I think, well, you can't do that. So um, the fact that they they look for the blessing because they have to, and they, they look for the blessing. And one of the things that I think about us in general is that we are a very critique oriented uh, group of people. We are management. Someone told me this and I thought it was such a good thing. We're not the workers, we're the managers. We want to tell other people how to do stuff. And I thought, you know, there's real truth in that. And um, so we, I remember years ago, decades ago, when I went to do my evaluation, a psych evaluation and everything for seminary and and he's, you know, he was asking me about Unitarian Universalism and I was going on about how racist it was and how classist it was and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, have you ever thought about leaving? Because I grew up Unitarian Universalist. And I stopped and I said, no. And he said, oh, I forgot. This is one of your religious practices, critique. And I thought, there is some truth to that. And so it's, to me, this is some, in times that are tough and there's, you know, we're just no amount of critique will get us out of the trouble we're in. It's just a really wonderful thing to hear people talk about what we do right over and over. And Aisha, you, you wrote something. I did. I would, um, before I get to that, I think, I think one of the things that's so inspiring about the prison ministry is um, to me as, as listening to you both talk and, and I had, you know, known obviously that you all are engaged in this work. It feels like, the best of Unitarian, what we could be if we strip away all the kind of pretense and pomp and circumstance of, of um, how we are inside of four walls. And so um, thank you both. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Mandy, for this uh, really, really, uh, it, it reminds us of who we could be when we are, you know, remembering that we're human. Um, so yeah, Meg asked me to write something. Poor Meg, I was so late on my deadline. Thank you for being patient and continuing to ask me because it was in the middle of the white supremacy hullabaloo. And I'm like, yes, I'll write something. And then I forget because I was writing about white supremacy. But what was interesting about what I had to think about is um, what Unitarian Universalism helped me do was, was uh, think about the faith of my childhood in a different way. So I grew up Muslim, very strict. I mean, I'm definitely a critiquer. So listening to you, I'm like, oh, I do that all the time. Um, and it's actually what I appreciate about our faith. I mean, I know it can be exhausting and annoying, but it, I didn't grow up that way. I grew up very much, you do not question the word of God. And my mother's favorite story in the Quran is when Abraham, God told Abraham to chop his kid's head off. And she was like, oh, but he didn't do it. I'm like, no, that's a shitty, that's a terrible story. Like there's nothing about that story that, Anyway, so, but you go question, right? So um, someone asked me, this is the story that I think is in the book. I'm pretty sure it's in the book. Uh, what, what were something good that you got from being Muslim? And my knee jerk reaction was nothing. And she said, Aisha, you're here. You're clearly, you know, functioning. And, and uh, you know, what she said, like, you know, you're clearly a good person. So there has to be something. So it really challenged me to think about it. And I said, huh. What did and then I, I kind of connected it to Unitarian Universalism. So two things that I did that I do carry with me that that um, only I think one of them is genuinely Unitarian. But uh, the idea I never internalized God as a man. I never internalized God as a white man or God as Santa or I internalized God as energy. 
because we there are no symbols of God or pictures of God in the Muslim faith. So my mother would say God is light. So the Unitarian part, God is light, God is energy, was um, something I could carry with me. And so that was an easy transition. And the other part that in, Unitar in um, Islam is the idea of sacrifice, that uh, fasting. I fasted from when I was 11 until I left the faith um, in early adulthood. Uh, but, the, you know, the idea that no matter um, tithing and sacrifice, so we fasted even though we were on welfare, we tithed even though we were on welfare and food stamps, and my mother said there's still people who have less than us. There's still people that have less than us. Uh, and so those two things I carry with me, and in Unitarian Universalism, we're not as great with the sacrifice because we like our comfort, um, but I think it's something that we're maybe now hopefully starting to um, embrace. But it what I love about our faith is that we can say, hey, we're doing this wrong. Let's make it better. Um, and we do hold each other. When, when, when push comes to shove, uh, find, you know, listening to what you said about the, the um, folks incarcerated, I, I have a tribe, you know, finding people that um, within Unitarian Universalism that are okay with my whole self. It's not everybody, for sure, but the ones that do, it's it's a gift that is incalculable, is what I could say. Uh, people who can genuinely be honest with me. So, and Aisha, was it important to you to have that space to be able to to sort of claim or reclaim the parts of your Muslim upbringing that remain with you as a positive thing? I didn't realize how important it was for me to do that, and it was. So I was grateful. And this woman to this day has no idea. That, she, that her question, and this was, I mean, maybe 14 or 15 years ago that she asked me. And so, uh, and then I thought about it again for writing for this, chap this chapter. Um, and I didn't realize how important it was for me to do that. So I was really grateful that I did because we are, the sum of all our experiences, good and bad, right? And so it was important to because my mother disowned me and I didn't see my family for 16 years. And so that, that's not a small thing. My, you know, she didn't see my children until they were grown. They, she wasn't there when they were babies. So there was a lot of pain from, you know, what this faith has, has um, how this faith, the Muslim faith has impacted me. And there was really genuine goodness that, you know, I didn't realize how much I needed to reclaim that. So it was important, and I was grateful for that. So thanks for asking me, Meg. Yeah. Well, that makes me think of one of the themes in the book always is having a community who listens to you, who who cares about you and your story. And Joanna, you have a really powerful story about that. Yeah. My So, so mine is, I, I kind of, which one? You're right. Um, because one of the big ones um, was a group of UUs who only knew me as Lizard Eater. Um, I had started a blog under a um, under a pseudonym. This was back when before Facebook, when when blogs were a thing, and I just started it when I began seminary, um, and then my baby daughter got cancer. And so this became the safe place where I could go and I didn't have to worry about soothing anyone else. I could just talk about what was going on. And I was already hooked up with other UU bloggers, um, Chris Walton and Christine Robinson, um, others. And they started commenting. And when I was in pain, they were there. And um, this is why, and, and Meg already knows this, this is, this is why whenever I hear anyone try to disparage online community, yeah, I, I have a testimony to give, right? Because these were, these were people who, who really did help save me. Um, and then in my own uh, home congregation, when I felt that everything that I had ever believed in had been stripped away, I had um, a deep listening group. And we started going through just some of the big questions of life. What is God? What happens after you die? What is love? And because of the respect that everyone had for each other to really, it was a deep listening group. So there was this focus on we're going to really deeply 
listen. We're not going to sit there formulating our own answers. Um, and then the fact that these were people who brought their whole selves and were willing to be vulnerable um, with no hyperbole. I say, the, this saved my soul. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. I was, you know, I don't know if we've ever actually talked about this, but I was one of those folks reading the Lizard Eater uh, blog uh, all those all those years, and I knew you as as that before we ever met in person. And um, you know, out there knowing that there was someone having the experiences you were having and and writing about it, and like asking for a community who of people you didn't know to to be with you on that journey and you know to pray pray for your daughter and and just hold you in love um was very powerful um for those many years i want to say hi to lena gardner um who uh who tells us that that she's watching and passes along her hello and um and her support and and pride in the prison ministry that that clf does hi lena good friend of the show uh watching watching us live um meg uh you uh you wrote uh, or edited this book uh and so um and and you tell us you're you're a lifelong unitarian universalist and i'd love to hear a little bit about uh your testimony um if if you if you would share what what is it in this faith that you didn't find anywhere as an adult like so many of the rest of us that uh, kept you here and saved you? I wrote about my childhood in the preface. I, my family was, um, my father was a bully. Um, I'm, he was violent and um, we lived in Charleston, West Virginia in a very Baptist neighborhood where all the kids told us we were going to hell and um, and the one place my parents breathed and relaxed, and thus we, the kids, also could breathe and relax, was the UU Fellowship, because they were with other people who shared their values. I mean, we were, you know, my mother was a racial justice activist in Charleston, West Virginia in the 1960s. We were not beloved by our neighbors. And, um, you know, whenever I hear that King thing about healthy alienation, that's what I got from this faith. And I feel like later when I came out as a lesbian, you know, other people who I know who were white, middle class, who came out, their parents were like, this is the worst thing ever. For me, I'd already learned, my parents had already told me that when people told me I was going to hell, they didn't know what they were talking about because people were telling me that through my whole childhood that I was going to hell. And so I had this um, internal support for, for coming out and again being seen as, you know, uh, blasphemy or whatever people want to call it. Um, but... Um, I think what I got at the fellowship was because we're in this tiny place, so there was no synagogue. The Jews came to the Unitarian Fellowship. There, you know, Hindus came to the Unitarian Fellowship. I never knew Muslims, but it, single people were at the Unitarian Fellowship. I'm sure they were gay. They were they were closeted. It was a diverse community, and the neighborhood where I lived was this development with just you know white heterosexual parents and their. Baptist children who told me I was going to hell. So, so what I saw there was life, I would say. And, um, and personally in my body, I knew breathing in a way that I didn't know in my neighborhood or, or even at my school. Um, so, so that really was precious to me. I mean, um, then we moved up to Akron where there was a much bigger church and it was a bigger community. And then through junior high, and I, I don't write about this, but you know, I was pathetically trying to be popular, which, you know, I was like the chubby sidekick funny person with all the cheerleaders and stuff. And then, you know, when I was in junior high, King got killed, um, Kent State happened, and I was like 20 miles from there. And when those things happened, these popular kids I was trying to be friends with were horrible. And I thought, whoa, who, what, you know, church is where I could go. And the kids in the youth group were upset like I was upset. And so I feel like, um, for me, Unitarian Universalism has always been about finding a shelter in the storm for progressive values, and which for me is being my whole self. You know, I, I mean, I haven't gone far from the values I was raised with. And, um, 
Yeah, so, and I feel like the stories that I collected um, and that we uh, we collected, a lot of them are about that. They're about somebody in a violent relationship or somebody who needs an abortion or, you know, people who are on the edge of judgment and um, acceptability. And so that's that's what it always meant to me. And I think that's why I'm so ferocious about wanting to welcome people in is because um, I just see how lonely the alternative is for so many people. Thanks for asking. Hey, Michael, you wrote a piece in the coming out stories that was kind of a testimony. You're muted. I did. Um, I thought Aisha had a story she wanted to share first before before I talk about Either that. One, yeah, that's fine. Um, because when, when you were talking, Megan, I was, and it actually popped into my head when Mandy was talking about um, the prison min ministry and, and what Unitarian Universalism, I think, can be, our potential. Uh, when I went to the Blue Convening, the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism convening, hi, Lena. Um, it was the very, okay, A, I wasn't the loudest person in the room, which warmed my heart. And I was included in a way that I will say I've never been included anywhere in any other space, except Lareda, Liberal Religious Educators Association. That's probably the only other space. But even there, you know, I, I'm the loudest person in the room. I stand out. I, you know, but but it, at Blue, what I glimpsed was um, possibility of what being truly inclusive looks like. Now, granted, yes, it was only, it was a black only space, and within that, I mean, it's not we're not a homogeneous group by any means. I mean, I'm Arab, right, and in Sudan, so I'm not. In, my legacy is not American black. Um, however. We, we we came together in a way that was just a, a, a transformation. And I rarely, I don't even like the word transformation because I don't necessarily feel transformed ever, but I would say that's the one time where um, the seed of all that happened after with the white supremacy stuff started there because I was just said, we have to at least try to do this, try more fully, more. Because one of the things I worry about in my heart, Mandy, as you're talking, I said, God, for the folks coming out of the prison who feel so accepted, what congregation are they going to walk into where they get that, right? I mean, how, how many hearts are we going to break from the people who are so accepted through Church of the Larger Fellowship? And, you know, I almost want to personally escort them into a congregation so they remain loved and accepted. Um, so... I want to say a little bit about that because that is important and I we've had success with that but it has to be the fact that we reach out to them first this person is coming um, we have um, a particular person who uh, is really active in their church in Florida and you know just walked right in and their minister walked up to me at, a, at some gathering and said I know you you're James's old minister from the CLF. And so um, we do have um, people doing that. And there's also some work going on in Chicago about welcoming people who have formerly incarcerated. It's almost like the same as the welcoming congregations work that we were doing before, only this is specifically around welcoming um, folks who have been in prison or in, in detained. So we are working on that. So thank heavens. That's nice. I think that might be a future show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those, we can get those, Chicago those, those on here. New hosts, I think I think maybe that 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 could take a whole hour to to delve into. Um, and you know, it 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 occurs to me hearing you talk, Asia and Meg. You brought up my own story that was featured in the the book coming out in faith. That um, one of the things that I love is that when we are doing Unitarian Universalism well we are glimpsing something that's possible um, in the future. Um, so, like something that we need that's possible. So you talk about the, the Black Lives of UU convening, Aisha, and you know, just glimpsing that, that something dramatically different and needed in our society is possible. Um, I, you know, my story is, uh, it, it's an apropos for coming out day, which was yesterday, um, which is that, um, a Unitarian Universalist congregation was the first time I ever met straight people who didn't care if people thought they were queer. Uh, like, 
and they weren't pretending to be anything other than straight people. They just didn't care. Um, like if people thought, oh, that's the gay church, well, it didn't bother them, right? And so this was at a time in my life when I was perfectly okay with who I was. I just had given up on the on the thought that I would ever find a spiritual home um, because of of my sexuality. So to walk into this community and just see people who, um, you know, and, and this, they were going through the welcoming congregation program at the time. Uh, so, and this was the early nineties and, um, they, they were, in, they were inspired to, uh, as part of their welcoming congregation. And I did not know this. I didn't know it, uh, until many, many months later, they were inspired to put pink triangles on their name tags. Um, uh, pink triangles being the symbol that um, the Nazis used for uh, homosexuals in uh, in concentration camps, um, and uh, and so it was a, that, that's it was a sign that the 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 LGB at that time in the early '90s community was reclaiming as a symbol of power the pink triangle. And these folks had these had the, these triangles on their their name tags. Today it would probably be rainbows that folks put on their name tags um, because uh, we're not so much into <laughs> this this symbol that comes to us from from Nazi Germany. Um, but I looked around and I'm like, wait, they're queer, and they're they're queer, and those that nice old couple like sitting over there, really. I, and and I just, you know, I kept, you know, thinking about, I want to hear their stories. You know, this, 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 like, and I very distinctly remember this, this elderly couple who were a man and a woman who both had pink triangles on their name tags. And I thought, I really like want to hear their stories because I guess maybe they're bisexual or they've come out later in life and, and remain together. They have the same last name and they're being very loving with one another. So it's, you know, they're probably not brother and sister. Like I want to hear their stories. And it, it turns out they're like a straight couple and it didn't matter to them. Like they, it was more important to them that they proclaim welcome to folks who are queer than that anyone actually um, could look at them and presume what their story was. And that was, that was really, um, We'll go back to that word transformative, Asia, that you, that you hate so much, but it's so true um, for me that like there were these people that existed in the world. Because even the folks that I knew who were totally fine with with who I was weren't weren't that welcoming and that open, and that I could find that in a spiritual community was profoundly life changing. Um, Jessica, I noticed that you are not behind the chalice uh, hiding uh, today. So I'm guessing that means you probably want to share a story of your own. I, I'm inspired. I'm so inspired by everybody's stories today. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, I got sober, gosh, it's like 16 years ago, I think now, something like that. Um, and uh and I, you know, I was told um, by my by my sponsor at the time to, you know, to pray to the God of my understanding. And I was raised Catholic. And, and you know, at that point, the God of my understanding, you know, wasn't really didn't want to listen to me. So so that was confusing. I was like, what, you know, what God am I going to pray to? And she said, well, just go home and write down everything that you think the perfect God would be, and then pray, pray to that. And so I went home and I wrote down everything and, and, and I prayed to that God. And I mean, and it worked, you know, I mean, that kept me sober for a long time, but, but I had this sense that maybe I had um, made it up, you know, that, that I sort of made up this God, that this God didn't actually exist. It was something that I was just kind of using. And I walked into a UU church and I heard um, Jocko Tenhove say, um, we don't believe what we want, we believe what we must. 
And to me, that was totally life-saving. I mean, that, because that was it for me. You know, I was believing what I was called to believe in order to save my own life. You know, I mean, at that point, there was nowhere else that I was going to go. Like that, if, if that's, if people were going to, you know, respect that this was what I was called to believe and that this was true for me, whether it was true for anybody else in that room, like I was going to be supported and seen um, in that, you know, that, that, that was it. That was it for me. That's my story. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> That's powerful. And so it occurs to me that we have these stories, right? That we, we have these stories of how Unitarian Universalism has changed our lives. Um, and we have these stories, Mandy, that you collect of, of how our faith is, has changed other people's lives and, and they are trying to return this blessing. Um, so the, the next question, I guess, becomes what do we do with these stories? Meg, you put them in a book, which is awesome. Um, but I'm guessing there are other ways that we tell that story and there are other ways that we live that story. Meg? I wanted to add that we, CLF is going to start a website for people who aren't in the book but wish they had been to tell their stories. Because um, I got a letter from a prisoner that I just said, oh my God, this guy's writing a book about living the principles in prison. I mean, you know, and he's an amazing writer. And I was like, I can't believe this isn't in the book. So I, so I asked Lori uh, Stone Sertoski, bless her, our tech director. And she said, sure, we'll set up a landing page where people can add their testimonies. Because um, I think reading other people's testimonies, just like Jess, like didn't come here planning to talk, but then you hear other people's stories and you go, I've got a story too, you know? I haven't thought about it in a while. And so um, I think I think spurring these on, and obviously you're talking about living them, Michael, in, in a much broader way that we can also talk about. But having places that we can draw from the well when we feel discouraged and when we feel like we can only see the flaws of this faith or, you know, what, what makes us want to leave. I think remembering um, what we, what we really do well. And, and just about the title, I wanted to say, um, you know, I wanted to talk about saving people and a lot of people really hate that language for other, for reasons. And um, cause I kind of feel like we're not saving people. We're not a religion, but, um, but a lot, but other people who grew up differently than I did um, just, like that word just makes them want to just shut off the whole conversation. So we tried to find language <laughs> that would welcome people in. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we would say, what healed you? What changed you? What saved you? You know, like kind of what transformed? So we, we were dancing around as usual to try to bring in people with a variety of experiences and languages. I, I think, you know, I'm, I can't wait to read this book. Um, this is something I'm, I know that I'm going to want to be handing out to my folks here at Live Oak um, because I think that, that, you know, one boat we really have missed is uh, the being evangelists for our faith. And that doesn't happen with elevator speeches. That happens with people telling their real lived stories. Um, We've at Live Oak, and it's usually tied to stewardship. Um, and every year we go, gosh, this is so great. We should do this at other times other than stewardship. So maybe that'll happen this year. Um, but we get people, you know, since I used to work for CLF, I get people on video. And um, I get people to, to tell their stories about what the difference um, happened, you know, when they came to this church. And I mean, some of these stories um, will just just blow you away but i think that the the next step is okay like don't just share that story here in this church we're already converted take it out there and and um be willing to share you know like i mean we are so willing to share our stories about going to this restaurant and how great it was and seeing this movie and what an effect it had on us and you know, let's learn how to, to testify out in public about what we're doing. That brings, oh. no, no, go ahead. 
I was just thinking that would be an interesting question to ask whenever we send the next newsletter out for our members who are incarcerated, like, because they're such great evangelists and they're always sharing the good news and spreading the word. I mean, they're growing this ministry like wild. And so what a good question. So how do you tell your friends about Unitarian Universalism or how do you how do you spread this word? I think I just thought that would be an interesting question to know and, and add. And add, and I also keep hearing and kind of bubbling up when I hear all these stories is is also a little bit of calling kind of coming in and how that that in testimony are all connect interconnected. But that's all. I just wanted to pipe in that. I don't know what you mean. Well, like I was just thinking, like you calling to well, I, and when hearing. Um, specifically like calling to tell your story it takes some bravery and it takes some some like some oomph to tell your story we're great like you were saying at doing critiques but it takes some it takes some inspiration and it takes some feeling important to do it and I think that's what the book is doing as well is making that an important part of our um, lived religious experience not just being on committees and you know doing all the other stuff that we love to do I think it also takes vulnerability and humility because we have, I mean, we have a lot of writers. We are an academic bunch sometimes and, and, and we have folks write a lot, but from a very cerebral place. So I, I can't wait to read this book. And I, what I appreciate, I think, is that it's much more it comes from a humble uh, place and, and vulnerable place, you know, that this is vulnerable telling our stories and uh, what moved us to be different based on a personal experience and not without footnotes. Um, this past Sunday, we had one of the most Unitarian services I think I've ever been to. We had a baby dedication in lieu of the story for all ages. The sermon was about from a, um, a Sephardic Jewish man here in Seattle who talked about the other 1492 and how uh, Columbus's journey was funded by money stolen from Sephardic Jews living in Spain. And then we had um, an offer from uh, Turkish folks that we are connected with here, Muslim Turkish people who wanted to share their, uh, it's called Noah's Pudding, and I'm forgetting now the name in Turkish, for our coffee hour. So it was a whole hodgepodge of things that were not connected to each other. And it was one of the most joyous, fabulous services. And one of the Turkish families, a, a man walked up to our minister and with, with just like just completely emotional and said, I'm going to come here. I want my family to experience this. Now, he's already involved in a Muslim Turkish center here, but he said, this is what I've been waiting for. I mean, this he just absolutely loved the service. And that was I think we need to stop saying elevator speeches. I think sharing who we are in our fullness and telling the story. When I when I give the long version of Unitarian Universalism, I always have people say, oh, I want to go there. I want to go to your church. When I was living in South America, I, I have British friends who are totally anti-religion. And I started talking about what I do and what I did and about Unitarian Universalism. And they said, oh, I, I would like that. <laughs> so um, let's get away from elevator speeches. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Meg. Let's testify. Let's testify. Let's be who we are. Why not? So we have some comments um, that are coming in from, from the live show. Uh, Pamela Negri writes in our chat that it makes her, our, uh, Pamela think about uh, Joanna's coffee shop hangouts. And, and a number of us have taken to doing uh, public uh, witness or uh, office hours in, in coffee shops and things. But I know, Joanna, you particularly do it, uh, you know, with a collar and a, and a rainbow flag on, right? And, uh, yeah, yeah. That? And actually, you know, thinking about it, this is something we haven't really talked about. And that is, I think that a testimony, when it is its most powerful, um, it's not a monologue. It's a conversation. Um, so I go, I, I started this years ago, um, and it was because um, my one of my kids was in high school and had a friend who was lesbian, and she thought maybe transgender, and she was really struggling um, that God didn't love her. And there was a Starbucks across the street from the high school, and so I started on Fridays putting on collar and rainbow pin and just going and drinking my coffee there when high school got out. I, I figured, you know, no teen would actually ever talk to me, but if I could just plant that seed, um, you know, that, but that, oh, maybe God doesn't hate me. And what wound up happening, and it's, it's why I'm still doing it today in, in different 
formats um, is it started a lot of conversations. And so I, I feel like I've been able to give some version of testimony, either my own or about Unitarian Universalism and the difference it has made in people's lives. Um, but, it's, but it's part of a conversation. It's part of someone being able to share their story with you and their pain with you. Um, and, then that, and then they open up the space for you to be able to testify. Thank you. We have some other comments too. Uh, Joelle Castile, member of the CLF, um, talks about uh, finding uh, calling uh, in places that are not clergy things. Um, Joelle is talking about homeschool community where where she finds ministry, um, or Joelle, I don't know what, what pronoun you use, Joelle, so I'm sorry if I got that wrong. And, um, and, and some other folks who are really appreciating this, uh, this conversation about story. So, so I want to wonder if we have more instances of how we share the story, how we engage in those dialogues, because I know that Unitarian Universalists are uh, famously reluctant to do that, that sharing of our stories. That I think white are, white Unitarian Universalists white, are famously reluctant. Because I, I have found, um, I mean, seriously, I think I tell people I am part of this faith because no one should ever be told they are not loved and they are not worthy. So for all our faults, and I'm the first one to list them in alphabetical order, um, and I'm a part of that. I think one of the things we do best when we at our at our best is to tell people they are loved and they are worthy and they we belong. We belong to each other, right? So I don't think it is just because I found folks of color very willing to talk about Unitarian Universalism. I have found, I think that, I don't know, my theory is it's the white New England Protestant strain of our sect of Unitarian Universalism that is super reluctant to talk about um, who we are and why we are. Well, sure. and there's, in, in, yeah, in, in the South, there's also, um, there, there's so many of us who have had the experience of being on the other side of someone um, like really try, putting the heavy push on to try to convert us um, into something we don't want to be. And I think that helping people to get the message of, okay, just because you're talking about what you love does not mean that you are doing that, right? You can testify in a very self-differentiated way. <laughs> Right. This, this is my story of, of having been saved doesn't mean that you there's something wrong with you. Right. I thought I'd re just read a couple lines from one of the people in here. His name's David McBreen. He's one of the incarcerated members. He says um, he had a Selly who introduced him to UUism. I grew up Roman Catholic. I then realized how many religions there are. I opened my mind thanks to the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I now believe that when the gates of paradise are open to us, they will have bleachers on each side with all the different faiths cheering on those that have made it. To me, UUs are fighting for all faiths. I call them the UFC, the ultimate fighting church. We are all trying to get to the same place. Some of us just take different paths to get there. It's where we are in the end that counts. Love you all. <laughs> I love that fighting church, you know, and I think in a way we have to, be more of a fighting church. I think privilege has made us just be like, if you find us good enough, you know, and um, and I think, you know, there are many things, I, I'm not saying what a blessing that we're in the time we're in, but I think it, it does bring up our fighting spirit and say, hold on a minute, there are precious things that are getting lost here and they have, they're grounded in our faith. And, you know, beyond the laws and all of those, which are, are horrible, but just the, the lack of respect for the earth, the lack of respect for human dignity, you know, those things that are for us religious. Um, so I, I love that image of the fighting church. <laughs> we got to get well, up. And, and, and I, I, that is but, wonderful. And I have to say, like right now, if, if you're tentative about giving your testimony, let me assure you, it's not actually about you. There are people that so need us right now um, that are just brokenhearted and they're, they're looking at everything and they don't know where to put 
you know, should they even have hope anymore? Um, and so your, your testimony is giving them what they need so that they can find a way home. We've had, we have, we've had in our congregation in the last couple of years, folks from Turkish people, families, recent immigrants, folks from India, folks from Iran, who are so happy to find us and they've brought their families and friends and folks from their community. Now, not everyone has joined, certainly. We're still majority white. But what's exciting is these are folks who are coming in and saying, hey, this is awesome. Why are you guys? I didn't know about this. And then we're, and are so happy and enthusiastic. So we tell our white folks, like, hey, do what these folks are doing. They're bringing their friends who are, you know. And so we, we, we hosted a Diwali service, which was out of this world. Um, we've, like I said, we had Turkish coffee hour dessert. So uh, there's just such an enthusiasm from folks who I have found from folks of color that I think is starting to spread in the white community. I don't know. <laughs> well, and, and Asia, what, what um, when you say when when you offered that very necessary corrective, um, it makes me think that you know it's this layer of privilege that that makes us um reluctant to share this our, our testimony um because we would have to be inviting people in uh to our space and and privilege makes us like want to be in our own bubble and it, it occurs to me like it's very connected to the fact that that our um incarcerated members uh are so jazzed about <laughs> sharing the story of their 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 testimonies and the ways that that they were saved um, in this place in these places that can really only be described as hell um, that they've been they've been saved uh, and I'll I'll use the word saved Meg I don't care if your your co-authors don't want to use that word um, that that they've been saved by by finding Unitarian Universalism in in hell uh, and um, and and I wonder, uh, Mandy, if um, if there are ways in which the the non incarcerated members of CLF or the UUA can learn things directly from our from our incarcerated members about how to do that, how to share their stories, if they would be willing to teach us in in a certain way, if that would be something we might do. Well, I think one really easy way to start is connecting with someone as an individual, which is to become a pen pal. Um, we have lots of people waiting um, on our waiting list to write someone directly who's a Unitarian Universalist and everybody who, um, to become eligible for them, they have had to take new UU, so they're relatively new and they're really ready to share their story and it builds a lot of really meaningful, amazing connections. And then the testimonies of the people in the free world, you know, like you and I, who talk about their relationships with their pen pals is really significant as well. And, and we find that on those one-on-one -on -one connections that the ministry is really flowing both ways. So that's one easy way. And like I said, I think I'm really gonna ask the question, um, how do you talk to other people, other people in, where you live about Unitarian Universalism. And you were also saying something about saving lives. I think that in the prison ministry, in a literal sense, we are saving lives because to learn, and, and it was brought up, uh, um, one of our phrases that we use is worthy now of love and justice, to learn that who you are today, you are worthy of love. It, it just can really turn someone on around that's in a very dark, dark corner. So it really is saving people in that sense. One of the things that I've observed about the prison, the folks in prison is that, you know, as I said before, they have to, they have to overlook a lot to find just what works for them. And they do. And, um, one of the most stark evidences, we, we, um, Amanda Aikman did a class called Full Spectrum Joy and associated the colors of the rainbow with traits of joyful people. And uh, I think green was where you align yourself with what's alive. And, and a guy wrote a letter that said, I'm in solitary, there's no window, but there are ants in the corner. And so I aligned myself with the ants because they're the only thing besides me that's alive in here. 
and you think about the spiritual discipline that it takes to look around that cell and to find the ants. And I feel like that's what the prison members and probably Asia, a lot of oppressed communities have had to do to survive is to look for the tiny, tiny places where there is life. And I feel like people with privilege who look for the little, you know, I'm so annoyed because, you know, my favorite kind of coffee wasn't at the store this morning. People who are, who are so used to everything basically being fine and then little annoyances coming and going, um, I think have a really different outlook on life. And so I, the prisoners, that's part of why they inspire me is their spiritual discipline to find hope in situations that, you know, as I say, I, I've never even had to consider. Excellent. So we have a couple minutes left uh, to wrap up this wonderful conversation. And we have some people writing in the chat about um, wanting to get to a place where they can share their, their testimony, to speak their truth out loud. So I'm wondering if, uh, if our folks in this conversation have some tips for those who are out there who want to get to the place where they can share their testimony. What, um, Joanna? I yeah, I'd say, um, like, you know, be, be uh, deliberate about it and first start with um, someone who's safe, you know, st start with a church member and, and just tell that, that church member, you know, I, this is something I want to begin doing and I would like to try this out on you. And do, I mean, like, evangelicals will literally say to you, may I give you my testimony? Like say, you know, say that to someone, may I give you my UU testimony and then get, you know, go out from there. Someone maybe who isn't a member of the church, but is a good friend, you know, say, Hey, this is, this is a part of my life. And I would like to tell you a little bit about it. Can I do that? And don't just wait till the operating fund drive. So, you know, have maybe throughout the year in, in church, have every single Sunday after the chalice lighting, have someone give a one minute testimony or a two minute testimony um, every single week and, and invite then have the space to do that in, in our worship spaces in our congregation. And I love that CLF is gonna, you know, host a Facebook page for that. I think that's gonna be fabulous. And maybe it could be both Meg written and maybe people can send Videos. Yeah. Um, it's going to be, be web, a landing page on the web, and yes, video or writing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other any other tips that people have or, or final words? I Meg? just want to remind what Joanna said before about dialogue. So I feel like part of why people hate the idea of testimony is they picture somebody coming to their door and just shoving it in their face, you know, and um, and I think that we are so unlikely to do that, but that's what we're terrified of, of doing. And I think, you know, vulnerability meets vulnerability. And so um, I'd say, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine. I mean, tell people who are hungry for it. There are so many people who are so hungry for what we're doing and who are so lonely. And so I think to be listening and responding to that part of people rather than let me tell you, I go to the best, the best church, and if you go there, you'll be good, you know. Um, but, but really, the dialogue part of it, and and don't limit yourself to just people who are looking for a church, because having a conversation with someone who already has another church. I love Meg's question of what do you love about your church? Like that's opened so many conversations with me. That person may be happy in their church, but their kid may not be, their neighbor may not be, and you may be giving them information that they can pass on. Well, this has been a really exciting and provoking conversation. Thank you, everyone. Next week on The View, uh, we are uh, hosting our co-moderators of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Alandria Williams and Barb Greve. And they are currently uh, in Boston running the UUA board's fall meeting and retreat. And one of the things that they're talking about at that retreat is how um, how the board can propose new ways of doing things that uh, dismantle white supremacy embedded in our governance. Um, so I'm hoping that there'll be some juicy things that they can share from that board meeting uh, right here on The View next week.
Meg, do you want to have a final word before we go? Thanks so much. This this is exciting. The book is in the books, the UA bookstore today. Uh, what's the name of the bookstore now? It's not called the bookstore anymore. In, in spirit. spirit. In spirit. In spirit. But if you go, I know it's featured on their homepage. So um, you can order your own copy. And, and I hope it's useful. Uh, and we will be putting out the website as we know what it is. <laughs> so I hope you'll encourage people to add to it. So long. See you next time.